Environmental degradation is not only a problem for the dry regions of Ethiopia. It can be just as devastating for countries like Rwanda, where rainfall is plentiful. This tiny country is grappling with the problem of a growing population trying to eke out a living on a finite amount of land. As in China and Ethiopia, over-farming on the hillsides caused serious erosion and a decline in fertility, forcing poor farmers to move into protected areas, such as the Rugezi wetlands, a wildlife site of international importance. When farmers drain this marsh to try to grow more food, they not only damaged an important wetland ecosystem, they also had a significant impact three hours drive away in Kigali, the capital city. The water that pours from the marshlands is a vital source of hydropower for Rwanda's capital. As the wetlands began to dry out, power stations below couldn't generate enough electricity. The Rwandan government rented diesel power generators to make up the shortfall. Dr. Rose Mukan Komeji took me to see them. So what is happening here is that those generators, we are renting them from this company, and we have been obliged to rent them, especially when we degraded the wetland, and we lost 20 megawatts of uh, electricity. And to run those machines, we're paying 65,000 US dollars a day. $65,000 a day, that's multi-millions of dollars yes, per year. Yes, it is mid million dollar, and as you must, might know, Rwanda is not a rich country. Some of that money has been borrowed from the bank, is from taxpayers. How does this affect the climate? Of course, those machines, they run under uh, uh, diesel, and when you burn diesel, you are producing greenhouse gases. Environmentally damaging and more expensive, locals had to pay three times as much for their electricity. So government policymakers focused on how to restore the Rugezi wetlands. If people were the problem, they could also be the solution. We had to take a careful look at what had actually been happening that damaged uh, this uh, system and therefore had to reverse that again with the human action. Uh, and this is why it is important to look at how human actions can destroy or can reverse what has been destroyed or even protect uh, our environment. The government decided to help the farmers leave the wetlands and to restore the degraded slopes above them, improving their croplands and encouraging trees and shrubs to grow back, capturing the rain. We have been supporting them by uh, doing terraces, specifically there on the hills, where they can increase and improve the productivity. The most important thing is to have people with you on your side. The wetlands are now recovering. Great volumes of water once again cascade down to power the hydro stations. Carbon-free electricity is replacing the diesel generators. Electricity prices have stabilized. Restoring and preserving natural ecosystems like the Rugezi wetlands benefits everyone. And so much more could be achieved. If we had more involvement by different institutions coming in to help with their available resources. Rwanda could do more, much more, and benefit much more, but so would other countries if such a partnerships and support were provided. What the Rwandans recognized is that the marshlands are far more valuable as a natural system providing water for energy than as farmland. This principle is the same for the remaining hillsides and ravines. What we're seeing here is very interesting 
because it's, it's a line between human activity and natural systems. And in the human activity, we've been able to value the, the productivity from agriculture and give it a, a, a monetary value. But in the natural systems, we haven't been able to value the trees, the biodiversity, the water that's absorbed into the biomass and into the soils. And there's another vital service that trees and plants provide, photosynthesis. Vegetation reduces the greenhouse effect by taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Climate change is better withstood with trees. You know, humans, no matter how in intelligent we are, no matter how capable we are with all our technologies, we are helpless in the face of climate change. We have not yet properly understood the miracles performed by trees. A measure of what restoring nature can do has been shown here on China's Lus Plateau where farmers have continued to prosper despite the worst drought in decades. Since the beginning of the project, the soil that nurtures their crops has been accumulating organic material from plants and animals. This holds the moisture and contains carbon. What's interesting about this is all these root materials, all this other stuff, this is organic material. And this organic material is mixing together with the loose, the geologic soils here, and it's making a living soil. This is where the moisture resides. Yesterday it rained and there's still moisture in the soil. This is where the nutrients are recycled so that each generation of life emerges here. And this is where the carbon is. What's interesting about this, they made this field. This is new. So they're helping to sequester carbon. Living soils like this retain on average three times more carbon than the foliage above the ground. If we were to restore the vast areas of the planet where we humans have degraded the soils, just think what an impact we would have in taking carbon out of the atmosphere. As much as a quarter of the world's land mass has been degraded, and much could be rehabilitated in the way we have seen on the Lus Plateau. And we've only just begun to recognize the real value of natural capital. Surely investing in the recovery of damaged environments is a cost-effective way of solving many of the problems we face today. Why do we not invest an equal amount, if not more, into a shovel-ready technology, so to speak, which is nature's way of sequestering and storing carbon. It is actually by investing in our ecological infrastructure and ecosystems in expanding the ability of nature to sequester and store carbon that we have the greatest opportunity to do something. And the wonderful thing is it's not only carbon sequestration. We're also faced with loss of ecosystems that will affect our food security our water security. We're losing species on an unprecedented rate. So maintaining, restoring, protecting, expanding natural ecosystems has multiple benefits, immediate in terms of climate change, but also fundamental to the future of many of the services that we simply take for granted from nature. My hope is that the developed countries, those most responsible for climate change, will recognize the enormous potential of restoration. What we've seen in China, in Africa, and around the world is that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems. If we can transfer the capital, the technology, and empower the local people to restore their own environment, it'll have enormous benefits. Restoration can sequester carbon, reduce biodiversity loss, mitigate against flooding, drought, and famine. It can ensure food security for people who are now chronically hungry. Why don't we do this on a global scale?